As we come to our study in the book of Revelation, I would like to ask you to turn with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 2. And as you turn there, I must remind you a little bit of where we've been. This book has been seen as a mystery book. People think it's allegory. People think it's hard, too hard to understand. And yet the Bible says it is a revelation. Not revelations, by the way. It's not the book of revelations. It's the book of Revelation. It's the revealing of Jesus for who he is. It's the unveiling of the Christ in all of his power and all of his deity, all of his sovereignty. His deity and sovereignty being that which was stressed in the first chapter. For as John was was on the Isle of Patmos, he heard a voice from behind him and he turned to see what this voice was that spoke to him and he saw the Lord Jesus. And he saw him in priestly robes, and he was girded in such a way as to show his his priestly role being discharged because he was in the midst of golden candlesticks. Now, these golden candlesticks are golden candlesticks that are not like what we would say menorahs. These are individual golden candlesticks. There's seven individual candlesticks. And what we see is the Lord Jesus is in their midst and he has stars in his hands and he's in the midst of the candles and he gives the interpretation in verse 20 of chapter 1 uh, that the mystery of the seven stars which you saw are the, and the seven candlesticks is this, that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks uh, which you saw are seven churches. If we had just read the first few verses of the chapter, we wouldn't know the interpretation, but because we continue to read, we find out this is what this is. These are representative. And as we are to be the light of the world, even so the church is depicted as being uh, seen in those candlesticks. And what I want you to realize is that this book will many times interpret itself. It will give an interpretation an insight into what's being set before John as he reports for us what he has seen. And I also want you to understand that it is a book that actually breaks up in an incredibly easy to understand way for those who would come to it and aspire to know what is set forth here. Early in chapter 1, it says there's a blessing attached to he that reads, to he that hears, and to he that keeps the words that are written herein. It is exciting to see that our God has everything under control. And that is what chapter 1 is telling us. Jesus is Almighty God, verse 8, and He's the one who stands in the midst of the candlesticks, and He's the one who has the stars, which are the messengers of the churches, and He's the one who has the churches. He's in control. And no matter what's going on in given states, whether it's Texas or whether... It's Florida, or whether it's Ohio. We understand that there's no one who's out of reach of God. You and I live on glory, grace, ground, man. I mean, God has given us a perfect world. But you and I are watching God begin to turn over some money changers' tables. Why? Because we have become forgetful. But this book does lay out for us in a very clear fashion how we are to approach it in chapter 1 and verse 19. The Bible says, uh, Jesus speaking to John, he says, John, write the things which you have seen, hast seen, which you've seen. In other words, write what you saw, me in the midst of the candlesticks, me in all my glory, me with hair like wool, eyes like fire, burnished feet, uh, gird in 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 a garment of the priest, and in the midst of candlesticks. Write that down. That's what you've seen. And then he says, and the things which are. The things which are, are what are before us in chapters 2 and 3. So write the things which you've seen, the glorified Christ, and write the things which are, the church of Christ. And then he says, and write the things which shall be hereafter. And this is what's beautiful about this book, is that it tells us what we're looking for. We're looking at what he just saw, we're looking at where we are, and we're looking at where we're going. And in chapter 4, all the way to the end of the book, pretty much, you hardly hear the church mentioned, because the church is what is, the things which are, okay? 
And when we get to chapter 20, we see that the church comes down. But it's very brief in the mention of church. The word church appears 19 times, but it's not mentioned at all from chapter 4 to chapter 20. You and I are blessed because we have a road map. We have a road map. It's neat to have a road map. No architect would set out to build anything. Uh, without some sort of blueprints to work from. You wouldn't set out to get out of Dodge down in Florida if you didn't have a way to figure out how can I get through, where, what road do I need to take, because you might be going looping around. My wife and I once were getting ready to go back to Virginia when we lived down there after we were first married, and I said, well, you know, I just think I'm going to go straight this way, and I know where 71 is, and I started going. I found 71 went right under it. <laughs> there was no way to get on it. And I'm all, you know, muscly man, young man, I've got this, I've got that. We were lost. And I'm out in the middle of nowhere. It's nice to have a map, isn't it? It really is. And God gives us one. He says, so tell about the things you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And when we get to chapter 4, we'll begin to see the things which are hereafter. But right now, we want to focus our attention on chapter 2. Chapter 2 is made up of seven epistles. An epistle is like books of Colossians and Galatians and Philippians. These are letters. Letters sent to individual churches. But this, this is a compilation of seven letters. It's written to seven churches. And these seven churches are sovereignly uh, uh, arranged on the landscape of geography of the day to really become touchstones from which we can see what will happen in the church age. It's interesting because when you read the Bible, the Bible says the Bible is to be looked at as a mirror. Remember that? The Bible says a man who hears the Word of God and does not do it is like a man who beheld himself in a mirror and went away, straightway, forgetting what manner of what man he was. He saw it in the mirror, but then he, he did not do anything about it. Now, you're going to see yourselves, we're going to see ourselves, I should say, in this catalog of epistles. But the question will be, are we going to go away like a man who looks at himself and forgets what manner of man he is? We need to look at these letters and find ourselves. And some of these letters you're going to say, that looks just like me. Let me set the stage a little further. These particular epistles represent for us that which is not only involving seven churches in real time, okay? There were seven literal churches in real time, and John is instructed to write to these real physical churches. But they are also emblematic of churches in all time. What I'm saying is every generation has had Churches that would be like Smyrna, a persecuted church, and some that were fired up and on the upswing and in, in, the, in, the, in the fires of revival, like Philadelphia. Uh, there's, uh, there's people who are awakening in different parts of the world. So you might have some that are being persecuted, like those who might be in Arab nations that are Christian, having themselves beheaded for their faith, like the Smyrnaian church. And then you might have those uh, who are in the Philadelphia fires of revival. You might, be the, might have those churches that are like, uh, like Ephesus, that have lost their first love, but they're still maintaining you know, a standard. And I'm just telling you that there was real churches, but there's also emblematic of churches in all time. But the thing that is uh, significant for us, this being a book of prophecy, is that this is the catalog of, a, of the church across time. And it is in an order in the landscape of the ancient day. It's like a crescent uh, order. So if you went on a circuit uh, in that day to various shipping cities and so forth and trade routes, you would go from Ephesus. Uh, you would go from Ephesus to Smyrna and down through all the way to Laodicea. These, 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 the circuit was really there, sovereignly there. And this is powerful because this gives us a catalog of what's going to happen in the church age. This book is not about uh, the church in, in its greater portion. It's about Israel and God's reclaiming of Israel and his putting down of evil and bringing in a thousand year reign called the millennial kingdom. That's what the book, is, the book, the book of the book is about. But this, before us in these two chapters, represent the things which are. Now, have I still got you with me? I hope so. This is a lot to take in. But when you see it in verse 19 of chapter 1, he's put an outline there. 
The things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. We're looking at the things which are. So let's dive in. Verse 1 says, and we're only going to take chapter 2 today because we can't do all seven. We'd be here quite a long time if we tried that. So we're going to break it into two messages. But it says, under the angel of the church of Ephesus, Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them that say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. A real church in real time, a real church in every time, and a real church across time. That's what we're looking at here. This is the first church mentioned because it represents for us uh, the apostolic age of the church. In other words, apostles are still there. The name of this uh, city, Ephesus, is a word that means desired. This is what God would desire. A church fired up for truth, that lifts up the gospel, that hates that which is evil and loves that which is good. Uh, however, there is something that is lacking and it has to do with their, uh, their hearts. They have their heads in the right place, but their hearts are not engaged. He says, you've left your first love. Now, as we look at it, this is the church of the first love. It represents in the continuum of church history uh, the period about 33 A.D. to about 100 A.D. Okay, okay? because this is at the end of the first century. John is about 90. We're coming to the close of the first century. He gets this, this opportunity to write at the close of that first century. Now, with that said understand something else about this church. It's a desired church. It's the church of first love, but it's also the apostolic church. You see, Ephesus is very interesting. It was one of the more prominent uh, cities of the New Testament era. This particular city had an arena in it uh, that would seat like 50,000 people. And it had open, you know, like a, it was like a, an arena that had, you know, open air. And they would bring people, they would bring in games. They would have beasts, fighting beasts and men fighting beasts. And, and as time went on, no doubt they probably did some of those killing of Christians at one point or another. But this was one of those cities that is huge in the landscape. But it's also huge spiritually because this city is a city where the, the Apostle Paul himself ministered for a term of three years. After he ministered there, Timothy ministered there for quite a long time, and even the Apostle John was a, a pastor to this church for a long season and is said to have uh, been released somehow from Patmos and gone back to Ephesus and served a while and died at this city. So the apostolic church, it all makes sense. This is the desirable church, and he's writing to this church, and red letters in your red letter Bible, because this is Jesus speaking, and the Bible says he's speaking unto the angel of the church. The, the, the word angel is angelos. It literally means messenger. And so when he talked about that uh, in chapter 1 and verse 20, he says the stars are the angels of the seven churches. Understand that these are the messengers. So this is a, a letter being delivered to a pastor to be delivered to the people. Because the people didn't have books. You know, they had to have it read to them. And thus it's, it's been given as a stewardship to the minister in the church of Ephesus. Now, how does he identify with them? In verse 1, it says he identifies with them by saying, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. There was something very important that this church needed to remember. That is what the Lord uses to identify with them. Do you remember maybe in John's Gospel, in chapter 10, where the Bible says, uh, that my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. 
and no man will be able to snatch them out of my hand. For my Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man can t- snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You may remember that, John 10, 27 through 30. Now listen, he says, I have the stars in my hand. I have the preachers in my hand. I have the ministers in my hand. And he says, listen, you need to know as a minister at the outset here that I've got you in my hand, but I also want you to know that I walk in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That means I'm walking in the midst of these aisles right now. You and I are here today, and Jesus is too. (laughs) We have the only organization that has ever been formed where the CEO attends every meeting. Okay, he's here If we're His. There are a lot of places that are called church that aren't church at all. They have nothing to do with the church of the Bible. They just use the word church because it softens the blow when they're brought into a room that is full of error and false doctrine. No, the true church of the living God meets as the body of Christ and the CEO, Jesus, attends every meeting. He says, I want you to know something. I am there. I'm with you. I'm for you. I hold you in my hand. Verse 1 says, I also know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. Now, this to me is something that I've been brought up with. I've been brought up with the whole idea of let's engage our minds. uh, Let's lean in and do right. Let's read our Bibles, go to church, tithe. Let's pray and let's witness. And I've got my list and I've been brought up with that. Just get in game. Do works, okay? Be patient, persevere, hang in there, do the right thing. So this particular church, when I look at it in a mirror, I think, man, that's the church we've been involved in. We've tried to champion truth. We've tried to take a good view of the Word of God and let the Bible be the authority in our lives. Many churches don't have that. They come to the Bible and they look at it as if it's something to be scrutinized, picked apart, and criticized. They even have a whole, whole school called uh, Higher Criticism, which tries to dissect the underpinnings, you know, of a tapestry. It's like seeing a beautiful portrait on the front, but underneath they're trying to pull strings. So, I don't like that string. Let's, let's mess with this one. And it starts de- de- just kind of dis- uh, deteriorating the, fir- uh, the front because they're, they're picking it apart. But for us, no. He says, I know your works. Now, our works should be born out of what we know the Bible says. And he says, and I know thy labor. The distinction is, one is good works, as in the energies you put forth. The other is coptus, which means you're cutting. The things that hurt you, the things, you do it to your own detriment. You do it because, even when it makes you feel uncomfortable. You do it even when it costs you something. He says, this is a desirable thing. This is the church at Ephesus. This is the apostolic church. You're out there bleeding on the battlefield, and I see it. I see you pouring out. Now, he goes on and says, and your patience, and that means to abide under. I don't think uh, we fully understand how much we bear with You may recall the reference to Lot in Peter's epistle where he says, that righteous man or that just man vexed his righteous soul as he beheld the wickedness of that generation he was in. It's amazing. You and I are beholding a whole lot of things. We're we're getting hit on every hand. You go to the fair and you see things that are terrible to see. You go down the street, uh, down, the, down the highway, and you see billboards that are an assault to the sensibilities of any decent person. Ladies, sometimes I want to just say to you, ladies, ladies, look at your husband and just put your hand on their hand and say, honey, I am sorry. Because the women in our day are assaulting the men. They're wearing pants that aren't pants at all. They're undergarments that are on the outside. They would have been called leotards or leggings or something. Now they're wearing them on the outside. All I'm saying is it's out of control and we're vexed. We are vexed. You can watch a football game and on comes some commercial and you're just standing there minding your own business, wanting to watch a ball game, and you can't take it in because you've been hit. Because what I'm saying is patience, abiding under the burden of being assaulted by the political arena, by the immoral things that are going on in our world, by the bathrooms being opened, by the, by the magazines at your grocery stores that are putting out their uh, people in various stages of undress. And what you see 
uh, on your TV shows and movies of our day. What I'm saying is, is he says, I know you. I know what you're going through. I just want you to know Jesus knows what we're going through. He's not shocked and he's not uh, unaware. And the Bible tells us that we're to cast our care upon him because he does care for us. And sometimes we need to lay that thing out because we are under attack on so many levels. And we need to be talking to him about that attack. Not acting like it's just the atmosphere in which we're living. Many of you have been in a condition where you've been in a place where there was paint smells or something like that. You've gone in and, you know, after a while you don't notice it anymore because you're in there. That's what you're living in and I'm living in today. We're living in a world where we're getting comfortable with the nonsense. He says, I know all this. And he says, and that thou hast tried them, verse 2, that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So what he's saying is there are people out there who are trying to suggest to the congregation at Ephesus that these are authorities and authoritative individuals uh, because they would say they had the earmarks of being an apostle. They would say they had, the, uh, they had seen Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. Uh, they would say that they had uh, seen him resurrected. And then they would say that they had themselves done some kind of miracles. And then they would say, on the basis of all that now, let me preach to you. And then they would try to preach wrong things. If you would put Deuteronomy chapter 13 in your, in your uh, margin there, you would find that the Bible says that in the, last, in, in the early days of Israel, they were warned that God was going to send them prophets that would prophesy and their prophecies would come to pass. And after the prophecies came to pass, that then they would say, come and let us seek other gods. And he says, I have allowed these people to go into your midst that I might know whether your heart is truly committed to me or not. And what he's saying in this passage is, is that there were false teachers who tried to give all of these earmarks. They had the word reverend under name. Have you heard of this guy? Reverend Jesse Jackson. Where did he get the reverend from? I have no idea because everything he talks about has nothing to do with biblical truth, unity, righteousness, or Christ. <laughs> it's level uh, on any level at all. Reverend Al Sharpton. There's another one. What about this guy? Uh, Reverend Joel Osteen. You say, I have to give equal time, right? What about Reverend Benny Hinn? I'm just telling you guys that there are people who are going to say because they have reverend, because they have maybe a crowd, maybe because they have a platform, that they are in our midst. And ours is to try them by the test of the truth. Are they true or are they false? He says, I know that you have tried them that say that they are legitimate leaders and are not. And you have found them liars. You see, my point is, is that we need to be people who test everything by the word of God. It has to be the plumb line. That was the earmark of the uh, Ephesian church here. He says, and you born, in verse 3, and have had patience for my name's sake, and has labored and has not fainted. In other words, you have borne the brunt of the frontal assault. Think about this for a moment. The frontal assault that they would take happened because they were the apostolic church. Paul was there. John was there. Timothy was there. Aquila and Priscilla were left there when Paul had to go at the initial uh, uh, calling, drawing of him away. These were giants of the faith. Do you know where the most uh, secular part of America is today? Secular, not liberal. You got licentiousness out on the West Coast. But the most secular part of America is the New England states which were where we started, <laughs> Plymouth Rock, <laughs> okay, <laughs> coming into, you know, Plymouth Rock, you got this thing going on there, and it's be because there was a place where things started, and it's almost like the devil goes right to the hub, right to the heart of things, and they've borne, verse 3, and have not fainted. Now look at verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know, it's real easy to forget to worship the Lord when we're so overwhelmed in the work of the Lord. Isn't that true? We need to remember what He did. Now, 
What you're seeing here is a pattern that will take place in these epistles. He gives them a commendation, and then he gives them a correction. The commendation was, I know what you're going through. I know your work. I know your labor. I know your trials. I know what you're bearing up under. But he says, I also have something to tell you you need to work on. But there's criticism or a correction that needed to be made. Can we ask the question, how easy is it for us to take criticism and be corrected? Do you know one of the strongholds the devil has set in play in our generation is to separate us one from another? Yeah, right? We don't, kids don't play with each other on the streets anymore. Uh, even couples don't even know what each other do at their jobs. You know, back when they would be on the farm, it was the wife and the husband, and they had 50 kids, and they were always busy with each other's back. They had each other's back all the time. Now the husband goes to work, and many times the wife goes to work, and they don't know what's going on in each other's lives, and it's sort of a hard thing, and so they, they, they kind of take their corners, and everybody exists, even in that relationship. But how much more in the neighbor relationship? I wonder if any of us could name six of our neighbors. If you've lived there for 50 years, you probably could. But if you just moved there in the last 10, could you name by name the people in that house, six people around you, six houses around you? It might be pretty tough because we've been divided so that we could be conquered. No, we need to remember that with that kind of a stronghold, we have to do something to uh, offset it. And the devil has used it against us. Now, what he says is, he says, you've born in verse 3, and he says, you've not fainted, because it is easy to faint. Verse 4 says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you've left your first love. Now, what is it that creates uh, uh, the emotion of our Christian experience? What is it? Isn't it what we hear in 1 John, so quaintly put, or so perfectly put? We love him because he first loved us and gave himself. For us, And what is it that makes us want to know the neighbor's name and get it right? It's, the Bible says, how can you say that you love God whom you have not seen and you don't love your brother whom you have seen? You've left your first love. When you first got saved, you, hope, you thought, man, I, my brother, or my sister, my mom, my dad, my friend, they need to know this truth. And we wanted to tell somebody. That was our first love. We wanted to be in church. We wanted to read the Bible. We wanted to tell somebody else how they could be saved. That was our first love. But we got our mind around what's true, and we're fighting the good fight. But we've maybe left our first love. He says, I have something, and you've left your first love. You've forgotten me. <laughs> and many times a husband or a wife might feel that way. And that's sad. But when Christians feel like they've lost their first love, it's not just sad, it's tragic. Because the church are the hands and feet of Jesus in this generation. That means it becomes our business to know the issues of people around us. When I go to work and I talk to people at work, I want to know what their wives' name are is so that I can pray for that person when they're sick. I want to know uh, what they're, who they are a little bit by talking to them when I'm with them one-on-one. -on -one, and I want to pray every day when I bow my head for my lunch. I want to say, dear God, save Dave. Save Dean. Save John. Save Mike. You save these, God, save these people. They're, I'm not praying out loud. I'm praying in my heart, but I'm praying for them. Because I'm God's hands, His feet. And I'm saying, God, help me to see how I can be you to them. This is not for nothing. But we've been divided, so we think, well, they're not my responsibility. I don't know them. But we could know them. Because people love to be able to tell their story. He says, you've left your first love. How do you get it back? He says, remember where from whence thou art fallen. I've just mentioned a lot of those things. Remember. And then he says, repent. <laughs> he says, repent. And this metanoia, this is that word that means change your mind. In other words, what you've done is you perhaps allowed something to displace what you once understood intuitively. You see, when we got saved intuitively, we knew this was awesome. <laughs> Then we got smart, and we started thinking, I'm going to think about it. 
And when I start thinking about it, I see a whole lot of nasty, and it gets me confused, and so I need to fight the good fight, and so I stiffen my upper lip, and I go march right through, but I forgot what I once knew intuitively. Now, my point is, is that if you ever take some of these ball players that are like baseball players, I heard about a guy not long ago who had this really, really strange style of batting. I also heard about a guy who had a really strange style of pitching, but they got it done. But when their coaches of the batting coach or the pitching coach began to mess with them, it messed them up because they made them think. The church today has lost the plot because what has happened is, is we begin to overthink what we once knew intuitively. There would have been a time when we would have thrown ourselves under the bus to help somebody else get out of a pickle, but today we're fixated on so many peripheral issues that we lose it. He says we need to re- change our minds. Repent means change. We need to go back and think. Wait a minute. What's important here? What is really important here? I was talking to a guy not long ago. He said his sister or his girlfriend's sister was married to a a girl. Okay, and. I had a little conversation going with him, and I mentioned to him a gal on the Internet, uh, Rosaria Butterfield. She was a, a lesbian professor. I said, she's got a great testimony. And the question came up among about six guys. What, do you think they're born that way, or do you think, or do you, or do you think that they, they, they choose to be that way? And I got this from Rosaria because it's so profound and so simple. I said, we're all born this way, <laughs> aren't we? I'm not here to condemn anybody. I tried to tell them I'm a mess too. <laughs> we, we all are a mess. The thing I do try to do in my own personal life is tell people, you know, I'm a mess. I just need Jesus. You see, our thing is we want to say, I got it together. I got, I got my church. I got it together. No, I'm a mess and I need Jesus. And suddenly Jesus is interjected into the situation and therein lies the goal from God's throne is that Jesus gets glory. It's not about me and you getting it right. It's about Jesus making it possible for us to try to get some things right. He says, remember and repent. And then he says, do the first works, verse 5. What came out of those first early days? Do you remember asking somebody to come to church? Do you remember that? You got really fired up about Jesus? You asked somebody, come to church. What happened? (laughs) Do the first works. It was intuitive. Man, I got something good. I want you to go with me. Some couple years back, I called Mark up. I said, there's this play called The Screw Tape Letters with Max McLean. And he and Becky and Linda and I got the tickets and we went down there together. And it was wonderful. But I was so cool. I wanted to share this with somebody. Said, Mark, let's go, man. He said, sure. We go in and we're watching this. It was so good. I'm so glad he came because I could talk to him about it as we were driving. This is great. Talked to my wife for weeks after that. She loved it too. We went and saw another one down in Columbus once called The Great Divorce. You want to share things. You know what we're studying? We're studying the book of Revelation, man. This stuff is cool. We need to be telling somebody else about how cool it is that God said this is what's going to happen. And guess what? It's happening (laughs) right now. Birth pangs. Rubber bands pulled to the point of snapping right now. When it snaps, you and I are out of here. Woo! That's exciting! (laughs) Man! And so we need to tell somebody, man, you got to hear the Word of God because it is good. And though this may seem a little tedious because this is a little housekeeping because this is the things which are. And we don't like to be criticized or corrected. We need to go back and repeat the first works. We want to tell somebody. And he says, or else I will come quickly and will remove thy candlestick. Now what's the candlestick? It's the church. And at this point in time, there is no church in Ephesus to speak of. There is, however, an ancient monument that is there, and it says Hagias Theagalos, which literally means the Holy Divines. It's all that got left. There used to be a huge church there, but they're gone. Why? Uh, Well, because they left their first love, and as time would have it, uh, they eventually uh, fell apart, and God removed the church from that area. Do you know what happens when the rapture happens? God's removing the church from the world (laughs) at that point. 
But sometimes churches go fallow. You may not know this, but in England, many of the churches over there are now turned into mosques because the churches died and in came the darkness. And not long ago, we saw a video of a woman who could take no more. She went to the church where Martin Luther preached and an imam stood in the pulpit and prayed a Muslim prayer. And she got up and couldn't keep her quiet. She said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuked you. And they carried her out as if she was a nut. But she just couldn't get her mind around what was really happening there. And in America, they're building mosques all over the place as we speak. I have nothing to say except we're in a day where the church is evacuating. And what's happening is... Darkness is running in. Happened in Ephesus. This was where Diana was celebrated. The goddess Diana, the trades were up, uh, upended and they persecuted Paul, but he had a great ministry there. John did and so forth. Verse uh, 5 says, Do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove your candlestick out of his place except you repent. But this thou hast, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, understand that this Nicolaitans is made up of a compound word, Nike at the beginning. You know Nike shoes, right? No, Nike sportswear. The word Nike in Greek means conquer. Interesting, isn't it? So now you know what the check mark means. It means to conquer, and it's kind of an interesting word. But the word Laetans at the end has the idea of laity, which many of you know what, a, what the clergy are. Okay, The clergy are set over against the laity. And what he's saying to the church at Ephesus is, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the ones who want to conquer the people. From the very earliest days, the religious leaders uh, who were false wanted to dominate and control the laity. It's happened in history, and we're going to get to that, but understand that this is what separates the true church from the false church in many ways. You see, the true church is the body of Christ. Every member brings something to the table. Gifts of helps and mercies and some of ruling and some of teaching and some of speaking, some, you know, of serving. But you have gifts. And every one of us understands that we are all believer priests. In other words, there's no difference in me and in you except that my gifts give me the mandate to speak and to teach. Your gifts are supposed to be conduits, as mine are, to bring people to Jesus. Your gifts are supposed to be bake, bake the cookies, sit at somebody's bedside, go to the nursing home, do something for Jesus. But no, because of the laity-clergy split that started in the church across the history, many times people think, I'm off now, I've done my hour at church, and i got nothing else to do for Jesus all week. They think if they just read their Bibles, that's good every day, and it is good. But it's not enough, because if you're reading it and not doing it, what? You're like a man beholding himself in a mirror and going away and doing the things uh, that you want to do and forgetting what manner of man you were. You see, the reality is, is like a pond has water coming in and none going out. It begins to become a very uh, overgrown and tepid and really not fresh. You wouldn't drink water from a pond. You and I need to be like streams. They come through, the water comes through, and it goes on to somebody else. We need to get something to take with us through the day. So we don't just read because we have our list. We read because we have a life to live. We bolster ourselves to go tell somebody. You may work with one other person, and your job is to win them to Jesus. And you know what might happen? You hate your job? You might find out if you win them to Jesus, God might say, well, your job's here done. Let's get up and move you over here. It, it might happen. I can't guarantee that, but... God will do great things through us if we'll make ourselves available. He says this, He that hath an ear, let him hear. You know what that means? That means that individuals in the church have to pick this up because sometimes the whole congregation can't get it. So don't think, what's he doing, what's she doing? Think, what am I doing? And allow yourself to hear. Jesus said this over and over again. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This is the thing Jesus says. Now, I'm going to move quickly through these next couple because they lend themselves to it and they kind of, the last two kind of go together. The Smyrna church represents the period of time from 100 A.D. to about 312 A.D. Uh, the word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh. 
And it has the idea of a, of a certain type of herb that would be dried out, crushed to give forth smell. You may remember gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And it was something of a fragrant aroma that was brought forth when it was crushed. So it's very uh, understood out of the gate that this is a persecuted church, a crushed church. From 100 to 300, what you have is you have the persecuted church. You have Rome in its ascendancy. You have the Colosseums being used to put to death Christians. There were ten different edicts given during this time that literally made it open season on Christians. Look what he says to Smyrna. He says, under the church at Smyrna, right, these things say the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. What he's doing in his identifying with these people is he's saying, I'm the first and the last. In other words, get an eternal view. If you're going to go through persecution, you need an eternal view. You can't be fixated on the front doorstep because that could be really scary. You need to get an eternal view. I went his him that was dead and I'm alive. <laughs> so get an eternal view. He's identifying. He's giving them something to buoy them up from the persecution. Uh, that they are subjected to. He says, I know your works and your tribulation and your poverty. Understand that this is an affluent city, Smyrna was. But he says, this, this group of people are now known for their poverty. It reminds me over in, in Hebrews in chapter 10, where the Bible says in verse 34, the Bible says of those Hebrews, he says, you had compassion of me, in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He says to the Hebrews, you took the spoiling of your goods. These people evidently did too. They're in deep, dire penury, poverty. They got nothing. He says, I know what you're going through in Smyrna. He says, you, I know your poverty, but you're rich. <laughs> you're rich. Because you've got an eternal view. You need to keep that. He says, I know the blasphemy of them which say, Jesus, say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, this is interesting because there are many people who are Jewish in their history, but they're not real Jews in their hearts. The Bible says not all of Israel are Israel. In other words, only those who have the faith of Abraham, the kind that says, I believe God and it's imputed to me for righteousness. These are the true Jewish uh, children of Abraham. And what he's saying is there's people out there who are saying they're Jews, they're trying to circumvent your faith. He says, you have not believed them. He says, they're blaspheming because not only do they not believe like Jesus set forth for us to believe, but they're saying you have to knit works to it. There's another aspect to it today. There are many people today that have a thing called replacement theology. They believe God threw Israel overboard because he could do a thing with them because God, you know, he's powerless to do anything when he wants to do it. So they've actually already tweaked the back of this tapestry. They're starting, well, you know, they messed up, they failed, they blew it. So now the church is grafted in. They'll use that word because it sounds real biblical because God uses the word to some degree, but not as an overarching replacement. And they have this idea. They have this idea that somehow God failed with Israel, so he gave us the promises of Israel, and now we're spiritual Israel. And my point is, is then they're saying what? That they're Jews. That's a problem from God's perspective. He says they say they're Jews and they're not. Now, they wouldn't use the word Jews. They'd just say we got the promises of Israel. We've replaced Israel. Now, that's a problem. He says, I know the blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Why is it blasphemy? Because it defames. The word fame is the word we get fame from. It defames the reputation of God to say he failed. He did never fail. He never fails. Isaiah 40 says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Isaiah 40, after he said, you guys are going to get carried off. It's going to be terrible. Your sons, your daughters, your children, your young men, your old men, they're going to be slaughtered. But comfort ye, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Because God has a plan for Israel. And by the way, that's chapter 4 to 19. <laughs> so he's going to put them back where they need to be. But he says, that's blasphemy. He says, fear none of those things, verse, uh, verse 10, that you will suffer. There it is. This is the persecuted church. 100 to 300. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. He says, and you will be tried. And you shall have tribulation 10 days. Remember I told you, 10 definable edicts to kill Christians were given over the course of this period of time. He says, but be faithful to death. 
and I will give you a crown. That's saying, I'm he that was dead, but now I'm alive. He says, you may die, but you're going to be alive. This is cool. This is good to know. You need an eternal view. Be faithful unto the end, and I'll give you a crown of life. But he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear again. But notice what he didn't say. He gave them no reproof, right? None. There was no reproof. There was no correction. Why? They're persecuted. They're poverty-stricken. No correction needed. They're willing to bear it down to the bone, if you will. And he's not going to lay any other burden on them. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh should not, shall not be hurt of the second death. Again, they need an eternal view. Persecuted people. And they're in every age, but in the history of the church, they were in that 100 to 300. It was a worldwide uh, persecution uh, executed under Rome, and they were killing Christians. Verse 12 says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, uh, the word Pergamos has in it the word gamos. Gamos, you've heard of monogamy, bigamy, polygamy. It means married. This church is where is representative of when Constantine married the state and the church around basically the, the year 312 and going through to, uh, to the 7th century. The church and state got married. They gave up their blessed hope. And then Thyatira, let your eye fall down into the passage a little bit. It says, and under the church of Thyatira, right. Thyatira has an interesting name as well. Her name means uh, continual sacrifice. So you have the church marrying the state, then you have the continual sacrifice. But what I want you to see is, the continuum was, you had persecuted church gave way to Pergamos. The church married the state under Constantine. After Pergamos, the church took roots, being married to the state, and then they began to have a continual sacrifice. It's called the Mass. Every time they gather for the Mass, they'll hold up a wafer and say, Behold the Lamb of God. That's huge. And what we're seeing is a continuum of the church history, what we would call eventually come to be known as uh, the Dark Ages, because things would be done in Latin, people couldn't hear the Word of God in, in their own language, they were dependent upon the, the conquerors of the people. In fact, it was in Pergamus that it says that they did embrace the issue of uh, Nicolaitans. Guys, I've held up a mirror here today. But what I want you to take home with you is the knowledge that you are part of a huge epic. This is not for nothing. You are in a huge epic. This story you came into had iPads, had TV sets, had planes flying around in the air. That never happened before. We're at the end of the line now. And we're sitting here scratching our head and saying, man, how could it be? Well, I can't even imagine what it must have been like, we would say sometimes, back in the days when all they had was a hut and a piece of land. I can't even imagine what it must have been to have no air conditioning and no cars. What it was like when they found a horse to be such a big deal that if you stole a horse, you were strung up and hung. Because that was not only a man's transportation, that was his livelihood. It was what pulled his plow. It was huge. That's all they had. Any power equipment? Man, most of us men would twitch. We didn't have a bunch of power tools. Man, give me my power tools. Uh, we'd go back to splitting wood the old-fashioned way, and we'd have to do it every day because there wasn't any electricity. My point is this. You're in the midst of an epic, and you and I need to remember that Christ wants us not only to do what Ephesus Church did, which is works and you know, calling out sin and evil, but also remembering our first love and remembering how we not only loved Him, because the first love is often amplified as being loving Him, but our first love included loving others. The Bible says the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. And when we got saved, we wanted somebody else to have this good thing too. But the devil perhaps slapped us back to our corner and we said, okay, I'll just sit over here and wait for Jesus to come. And we gave up our hope and we don't even remember how much uh, that meant to us. Some of us got saved at some of these preachers' meetings that were preaching how Jesus is coming and there's going to be a kingdom and heaven's to gain and hell's to shun. Listen, hell's still hot. Heaven's still good. People need to be saved. And for you and for me, we need to see that God gave us the blueprint of what this church age is like. And when we get down to Laodicea in chapter, two, uh, chapter 3, it's where the people begin to tell the preachers how it's supposed to be and that's where we are today. I am sad to report. But for you and for me, we need to be 
under the authority of God's Word. Would you bow with me for a moment?